Pop Goes the Weasel by James Patterson. Read by Keith David, Roger Reese, and Gareth Scott. That night, as he was driving home from work at the British Embassy, Geoffrey Schaefer started to feel that he was losing control again. He was beginning to frighten himself. His whole life had begun to revolve around a fantasy game he played called The Four Horsemen. In the game, he was the player called Death. The game was everything to him, the only part of his life with real meaning. He sped across town from the British Embassy all the way to the Petworth district of North West. He knew he shouldn't be there, a white man and a spiffy jaguar. He couldn't help himself there, any more than he could that morning. He stopped the car just before he got to Petworth. Schaefer took out his laptop and typed a message to the other players, the horsemen. Friends, death is on the loose in Washington. The game is on. He started the jag again and rode a few more blocks to Petworth. The usual outrageously provocative hookers were already parading up and down Varnum and Webster streets. He slowed to a stop beside a small black girl, who looked to be around 16 and had an unusually pretty face. Her legs were long and slender for such a petite body. She wore too much makeup for his taste. Still, she was hard to resist, so why should he? Nice car. Jaguar. I like it a lot. She cooed and then smiled and made a sexy little O with her lipsticked mouth. You're cute too, mister. He smiled back at her. Jump in then. Let's go for a test ride. See if it's true love or just infatuation. He glanced round the street quickly. None of the other girls were working this corner. A hundred for full service, sweetie? She asked as she wiggled her tight little butt inside the jag. Her perfume smelled like eau de bubblegum, and she seemed to have bathed in it. As I said, get into the car. A hundred dollars is petty cash for me. He knew he shouldn't be picking her up in the Jaguar. But he took her for a joyride anyway. He couldn't help himself now. He brought the girl to a small wooded park in a part of Washington called Shaw. He parked in a thicket of fir trees that hid the car from sight. He looked at the prostitute, and she was even smaller and younger than he had thought. How old are you? he asked. How old do you want me to be? she said, and smiled. Sweetie, I need the money first. You know how it works. Yes. But do you? he asked. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a switchblade knife. He had it at her throat in an instant. Don't hurt me, she whispered. Just be cool. Get out of the car slowly. Don't you dare scream. You be cool. Schaefer got out with her, staying close, the knife still pressed to the hollow of her throat. It's all just a game, darling, he explained. My name is Death. You're a very lucky girl. I'm the best player of all. As if to prove it, he stabbed her for the first time. Samson and I were on duty in Southeast. We're senior homicide detectives, and I'm also liaison between the FBI and the D.C. police. We got a call about half past midnight telling us to go to an area of Washington called Shaw. There'd been a bad homicide. A lone Metro squad car was at the murder scene, and the neighborhood cycles had turned up in pretty fair numbers. It looked like a bizarre block party in the middle of hell. Fires were blazing nearby, throwing off sparks in two trash barrels, which made no sense given the sweltering heat of the night. The victim was a young woman, probably between 14 and her late teens, according to the radio report. She wasn't hard to find. Her nude, mutilated body had been discarded in a clump of briar bushes in a small park less than ten yards off a paved pathway. Samson and I approached the body. A boy shouted at us from the other side of the crime tape. Yo, yo, she's just some street whore. Samson and I walked on and joined two uniformed cops standing by the body. They were obviously waiting for reinforcements. Apparently, we were it. You call emergency services? I asked the uniforms. Thirty-five minutes ago and counting, said the older-looking of the two. He was probably in his late twenties, sporting an attempted mustache, and trying to look as if he were experienced at scenes like this one. That figures, I shook my head. You find any ID anywhere around here? No ID. We looked around in the bushes, nothing but the body, said the younger one. And the body has seen better days. He was perspiring badly, and looked a little sick. I put on latex gloves and bent down over the corpse. She did appear to be in her mid to late teens. The girl's throat had been slit from ear to ear. Her face was badly slashed. 
so were the soles of her feet, which seemed odd. She'd been stabbed a dozen or more times in her chest and stomach. I pushed open her legs. I saw something that made me sick. A metal handle was barely visible between her legs. I was almost sure it was a knife, and that it had been driven all the way into her vagina. Samson crouched and looked at me. What are you thinking, Alex? Another one? I shook my head, shrugged my shoulders. Maybe, but she's an addict, John. Tracks on her arms and legs, probably behind her knees and under her arms. Our boy doesn't usually go after addicts. He practices safe sex. The murder's brutal, though. That fits the style. You see the metal handle? Samson nodded. He didn't miss much. Clothes, he said. Where the hell they go to? We need to find the clothes. Somebody in the neighborhood probably stripped them off her already, said the young uniform. There was a lot of disturbance around the body, several footprints in the dirt. That's how it goes around here. Nobody seems to care. We're here, I said to him. We care. We're here for all the Jane Doe's. Jeffrey Schaefer was so happy he almost couldn't hide it from his family. He had to keep from laughing out loud as he kissed his wife Lucy on the cheek. He caught a whiff of her Chanel No. 5 perfume, then tasted the brittle dryness of her lips as he kissed her again. They were standing around like statues in the elegant gallery hall of the large Georgian house in Calorama. The children had been summoned to say goodbye to him. His wife, the former Lucy Reese Cousins, was ash blonde, her sparkling green eyes even brighter than the Bulgarian spark jewelry that she always wore. Slender, still a beauty of sorts at thirty-seven, Lucy had attended Newnham College of Cambridge for two years before they were married. She read useless poetry and literary novels, and spent most of her free time at equally pointless lunches, shopping with her expatriate girlfriends, going to polo matches or sailing. Occasionally Schaefer sailed with her. He'd been a very good sailor once upon a time. Lucy had been considered a prize catch, and he supposed that she still would be for some men. Well, they could have her skinny, bony ass and all the passionless sex they could stomach. Schaefer hoisted up his four-year-old twins, Trisha and Erica, one in each arm, two mirror images of their mother. He'd have sold the twins for the price of a postage stamp. He hugged the girls and laughed like the good papa he always pretended to be. Then he formally shook twelve-year-old Robert's hand. The debate being waged in the house was over whether Robert should be sent back to England for boarding school, perhaps to Winchester, where his grandfather had gone. Schaefer gave his son a crisp military salute. Once upon a time, Colonel Geoffrey Schaefer had been a soldier. Only Robert seemed to remember that part of his father's life now. I'm only going away to London for a few days, and this is work, not a holiday. I'm not planning to spend my nights at the Athenaeum or anything like that, he told his family. He was smiling jovially, the way they expected him to be. Try and have some fun while you're away, Dad. Have some laughs. God knows you deserve it, Robert said, talking in the lower octave man-to-man's voice that he seemed to be adopting lately. Bye, Daddy! Bye, Daddy! The twins chorused shrilly, making Schaefer want to throw them against the walls. Schaefer wasn't actually going to London. He had a much better plan for the weekend. He was going to play his fantasy game right here in Washington. He sped due east rather than towards Washington's Dulles Airport, feeling as if a tremendously burdensome weight had been lifted. God, he hated his perfect English family and even more their claustrophobic life here in America. Schaefer's own family back in England had been perfect as well. He had two older brothers, and they'd both been excellent students, model youths. His father had been a military attaché, and the family had travelled around the globe until he was twelve when they returned to England and settled in Guildford, about half an hour outside London. Once there, Schaefer began to expand on the schoolboy mischief he'd practised since he was eight. The centre of Guildford contained several historic buildings, and he set out to gleefully deface all of them. He began with the abbot's hospital, where his grandmother was dying. He painted obscenities on the walls. Then he moved on to the Guildford Castle, Guild Hall, the Royal Grammar School, and Guildford Cathedral. He scrawled more obscene words and splashed large penises in bright colours. He had no idea why he took such joy in ruining beautiful things, but he did. He loved it. And he especially loved not getting caught. Schaefer was eventually sent to school at Rugby, where the pranks continued, and then he attended St. John's College, where he concentrated on philosophy, Japanese, and shagging as many good-looking women as he possibly could. All his friends were mystified when he went into the army at twenty-one. 
His language skills were excellent, and he was posted to Asia, which was where the mischief rose to a new level, and where he began to play the game of games. He stopped at 7-Eleven in Washington Heights for coffee. Three coffees, actually. Black, with four sugars in each. From the 7-Eleven, he drove into the northeast part of Washington, a middle-class section called Eckington. He began to recognize the streets when he was west of Gallaudet University. Most of the structures were two-storied apartments with vinyl siding, either red brick or a hideous Easter egg blue that always made him wince. He stopped in front of one of the red brick garden apartments on Newland Terrace near 2nd Street. This one had an attached garage. A rusted and taped-up purple and blue taxi was parked inside the two-car garage. Schaefer had been using it for about four months. The taxi gave him anonymity, made him almost invisible anywhere he chose to go in D.C. He called it his nightmare machine. He wedged the Jaguar beside the taxi cab. Then he jogged upstairs. Once inside the apartment, he switched on the air conditioning. He drank another sugar-laced coffee. Then he took his pills, like a good boy. Thorazine and Librium. Benadryl, Xanax, Vicodin. He'd been using the drugs in various combinations for years. It was mostly a trial and error process, but he'd learned his lessons well. Feeling better, Geoffrey? Yes, much better, thank you. Schaefer went into the small barren bathroom, which smelled of cheap cleanser. He stood before the mirror. He liked what he saw. Very much so. Thick and wavy blonde hair that he would never lose. A charismatic, electric smile. Startling blue eyes that had a cinematic quality. Excellent physical shape for a man of forty-four. He went to work, starting with brown contact lenses. He'd done this so many times he could almost do it blindfolded. It was part of his trade craft. He applied blackface to his face, neck, hands, wrists. Thick padding to make his neck seem broader than it was. A dark watch cap to cover every last strand of hair. He stared hard at himself and saw a rather convincing-looking black man, especially if the light wasn't too strong. Not bad, not bad at all. It was a good disguise for a night on the town, especially if the town was Washington. At 10.25, he went down to the garage again. He carefully circled around the Jaguar and walked to the purple and blue taxicab. He had already begun to lose himself in delicious fantasy. Schaefer reached into his pants pocket and pulled out three unusual-looking dice. They were twenty-sided, the kind used in most fantasy role-playing games or RPGs. They had numerals on them rather than dots. He held the dice in his left hand, rolling them over and over. There were explicit rules to the four horsemen. Everything was supposed to depend on the dice roll. The idea was to come up with an outrageous fantasy, a mind-blower. The four players around the world were competing. Schaefer had already prepared an adventure for himself, but there were alternatives for every event. Much depended on the dice. That was the main point. Anything could happen. He got into the taxi, started it up. Good Lord, was he ready for this. He had a gorgeous plan mapped out. He would pick up only those few passengers, fares, who caught his eye, fired up his imagination to the limit. He wasn't in a hurry. He had all night. He had all weekend. He was on a busman's holiday. His route had been laid out beforehand. First he drove to the fashionable Adams Morgan neighborhood. Around 11.30 on Columbia Road, he slowed the taxicab. His heart began to thump. Something very good was shaping up ahead. A handsome-looking couple was leaving the popular Chief Ike's Mambo Room. A man and a woman, Hispanic, probably in their late twenties, sensual beyond belief. He rolled the dice across the front seat. Six, five, four, a total of fifteen. A high count. Danger. That made sense. A couple was always tricky and risky. Schaefer waited for them to cross the pavement, moving away from the restaurant canopy. They came right towards him. How accommodating. He touched the handle of the magnum that he kept under the front seat. He was ready for anything. 